bienvenue à cette première soirée du programme de l'automne du Centre culturel suisse. Ça fait plaisir d'avoir une, une salle quasi pleine alors qu'il fait si beau dehors et que la tentation des terrasses est encore forte. Euh, nous commençons euh, par cette euh, soirée dédiée à l'architecture contemporaine euh, avec euh, le, le bureau AGPS, donc basé à Zurich et à Los Angeles, euh, composé de Marc Angelin, Marc Angelil, pardon, Sarah Graham et Manuel Scholl. Alors ces trois-là vous préparent un pas de trois, ça va être assez performatif, enfin il y aura plein de surprises. Et en fait, cette conférence est un partenariat entre la galerie d'architecture, représentée ici par Gian Mauricio, son directeur, et le Centre culturel suisse. Je crois que c'est la deuxième ou troisième fois qu'on qu fait une collaboration comme ça. En fait, c'est Gian Mauricio qui est venu nous dire qu'il organisait cette exposition, euh, donc qui est encore visible à la galerie d'architecture. Il va vous en parler. Et puis, nous avons pris la balle au bon pour organiser cette conférence euh, comme ça, on fait une sorte de, de joint venture euh, dans, dans le quartier du, du Marais entre euh, une initiative privée et une initiative publique. C'est aussi comme ça qu'on draine euh, des gens euh, complémentaires. Euh, avant de passer la parole à, à Gian Maurizio, je voudrais juste vous rappeler qu'il y a deux autres conférences euh, d'architecture contemporaine prévues dans le programme du Centre culturel suisse pour cet automne. Ça sera le 2 octobre le bureau euh, Büchner Brunler de Bâle, et puis donc ça se passera ici, et puis le 24 novembre euh, l'ingénieur Jörg Konzett qui a notamment euh, travaillé huit ans avec euh, Peter Zumthor, et euh, ça ça sera au centre Pompidou donc le 24 octobre donc une un automne très très axé sur l'architecture contemporaine dans notre programmation voilà euh, welcome bienvenue à GPS à chacun de vous euh, bienvenue à Gian Maurizio qui va vous dire quelques mots sur le bureau AGPS. Merci pour cette proposition. Euh, bonsoir tout le monde. C'est bon, vous m'entendez Je n'ai pas trop l'habitude de parler avec un micro. Chez nous, euh, on essaie de faire ça sans micro. On, on a une bonne acoustique dans, de, de galerie. Euh, ben, tout d'abord, merci beaucoup au, au Centre culturel suisse qui a accepté cette, notre proposition de, de, de faire... Euh, cette conférence en complément à l'exposition, on est en plus pas loin. Je pense que la plupart d'entre vous sont entre-temps passés à la, à la galerie d'architecture qui est, je le rappelle, euh, 11 rue des Blancs-Manteaux, à deux minutes ici à pied, pour voir l'exposition euh, de, de, des architectes euh, AGPS qui, qui, qui s'appelle Connect des Dots. C'est une exposition euh, qui est partie de l'idée du plan de la galerie, c'est-à-dire que quand on, on voit la, le plan de la galerie, vous avez tous les poteaux qui sont euh, dans la galerie. Et en fait, l'idée, c'était d'essayer de, de relier ces points, ces points par rapport à, 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 à l'espace, de faire une intervention spatiale en lien avec le lieu et en même temps de, de mettre en relation les différents projets euh, qui, eux, ils ont euh, fait sur euh, ces, ces une vingtaine d'années. Évidemment, il, il y aura euh, Sarah Graham et les Marc Emmanuel qui vont vous en parler plus en, plus en, en détail. Euh, L'exposition est ouverte encore jusqu'à samedi, pour ceux qui ne l'ont pas encore vue. Euh, il y a, en complément avec l'exposition, une publication qui, ce soir, pour ceux qui euh, le souhaiteraient, est euh, vendue à la sortie de la sera vendu à la sortie de, de, de la conférence et à un prix spécial, c'est-à-dire vous aurez le livre pour 20 euros. Voilà, c'est un euh, petit cadeau qu'on fait pour, euh, pour vous qui êtes là ce soir. En tout cas, je vous remercie à tous d'être venus. Je remercie beaucoup les architectes pour être revenus de, de Zurich et je passe la parole à Marc Angélil. Merci, Jeanne. Merci, euh, Olivier. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be here uh, tonight. We decided to do the conference Uh, in English, in order to avoid some kind of Babylonian confusion uh, of, of languages. So we thought uh, today, Sarah and Manuel, to show you uh, some little glimpses of the exhibition, uh, very few slides on some projects uh, that will tell stories about the projects, the, the problems we encountered, the fun we had 
with the projects, and some of the projects that we are showing were done in collaboration with Retop Feininger and Hans-Peter uh, Oester. So this is a, a collaborative effort. But first of all, I would like to express my gratitude to the Centre Culturel Suisse uh, for the invitation and to Pro Helvetia as well as to La Galerie d'Architecture and uh, the Architectural Journal Architecture d'Aujourd'hui for their extremely generous uh, support in order to make this project happen. So, connect the dots. Uh, you know this as kids. Uh, you might have played it where you try to connect one, two, three, four, five to get uh, some kind of image uh, that is being uh, created. And this is how the uh, exhibition happened, trying to connect the columns of, of the gallery, and then we realized that maybe there is a concept behind it, uh, and we could start to connect the dots between uh, the projects. So the catalog of the exhibition uh, that you can find uh, outside uh, is a little uh, folder uh, that begins to tell you, uh, you can open it up, and you find uh, the projects with little numbers, and the numbers are not in a chronological order, and you go to one, and then you go to five, uh, etc. Uh, this is where the work is being produced. Uh, on the left, the LA uh, studio, and on the right, the uh, Zurich uh, atelier. Uh, it's a kind of the loft atmosphere, extremely open, also quite noisy at, at some times, uh, and they are both in former uh, factories. So this has a lot to do with the phenomenon of gentrification that we encounter in many of our cities, but this is where uh, the work has been uh, produced with many uh, collaborators. So we start with dot number eight. This is where we would like uh, to enter, uh, and it's uh, the Hollywood house uh, just below the D of uh, the word Hollywood that you very well know. Originally, the writing on the hill was Hollywood land, and it was a real estate uh, venture. So it's a balancing act. This is one of the first projects that, that we did uh, on an extremely uh, steep slope. Really, nobody in LA wanted to build on it. Uh, and since uh, some of us in the office of Swiss, we thought that's easy to do. But then we had to get a very good uh, engineer. Uh, we got Arab engineers uh, from, from LA, and they realized that the most difficult thing was not the weight of the house, but the stabilization of the hill. So they did, they did a very sophisticated uh, three-dimensional uh, structural framework that holds the hill uh, in place, on which uh, a house was put on it, uh, and the house was calculated as zero kilograms or zero ton in the structural calculation because it was meaningless. Whatever you have below ground is pure gold. Okay? So this is where we spend all our money. Uh, the house, so this is the foundation work that you see here, and we realized that it would be good to do some kind of a balancing act uh, using case, case study construction uh, techniques but then to hold the whole thing uh, back, uh, stabilized by a steel frame, and then the whole thing is, as it's normally the case in LA, it's very simple, two by four, two by six wood uh, construction. So this is what is happening. You have the steel frame on this side, only on this side. The wood is holding the steel uh, in place, and the beams are cantilevering, held back, by those struts. And this is how it looks. The most important thing is the west sun shining in the gap. And the, the roof doesn't touch the house on this side. So the, the light comes in uh, and projects on, on this wall. And then uh, we had the unbelievable honor uh, that a very famous LA uh, photographer, what's his name, Sarah? Julius Schulman who did the famous photographs of uh, uh, Pierre Koenig that you probably all know. Uh, he came and he insisted Sarah would stand here uh, and that we would take uh, the, the, the cactus from his garden, bring it to our garden, because he wanted to do something in the foreground. And this is how it looks on the inside with the clear story window uh, on top. 
the back and the cable here holding everything in place. So this was project number nine. So who is number seven? Me. Is Manuel. <clears throat> Next project is a um, multifamily house in Zurich where we tried or we had to combine the very precious uh, site with uh, the construction laws. And as you might see here, it's the villa in the back in a very nice garden, uh, which is under protection. It's close to Galatrava's train station and uh, rents are ex were expected to be really high. I don't tell any numbers, but it's amazingly high. And the owner had the possibility to have some more volume uh, built. And in this competition, we did not do just uh, one uh, building, which our competitors uh, did, but uh, two in order to have these volumes fitting into the scale of the neighboring old uh, buildings. So uh, there is one flat, a big flat, uh, on every uh, level. And for us, the big theme was how to put these volumes in this very precious garden. And the idea was to have everything within the volume. So even the terraces are within uh, the volume. And to uh, have a filter. Uh, which is making the screen between this garden and the old and the new. So we have uh, glass around, we have movable uh, walls inside, and we have this uh, curtain, which is the special item in this uh, building. And that's where uh, very high rents and... Uh, very special construction uh, meet. Uh, Sarah says those kind of uh, details can only be done in uh, Switzerland. Uh, probably not because of the knowledge, but because of the craftsmen which then can do it. And we have this multi-layered here, the screen, which is uh, of stainless steel, so very heavy. Uh, with the motors, we have then gliding glasses to close off the interior terraces. We have the glasses, insulation, heating, everything coming together in just 40 centimeters from here to there. So much of our effort went into this, uh, into this uh, detail, but also into making this experiment working. And so you see the sample, which has been going on and off for about 500 uh, times. So you won't see all the duration. And what we are very interested in is uh, not only that it works, but also what it does uh, for the space within and also for the space without uh, the building. And uh, it's a mock-up we had the pleasure to show it in a Biennale in Venice. I think it was 2008. So the building was done, and we brought it there as a, a sample of this uh, very project. And uh, that's the entry uh, part, which uh, changes its exteriors and makes it possible to have this new volume within this uh, old and tight and expensive setting. And that's a view from inside out done by a photographer. And I'd like to add that even that project couldn't afford architectural woven fabrics. So the material of the screen we found in industrial bakeries in Germany, which is why we had to do all the tests, because it was never made for this, this purpose. I'm going to jump back across the Atlantic to um, Topanga Canyon, which is just north on the coast of Los Angeles, and a house that we designed where the idea of the house is landscape. Uh, we did 
drawings first about landscape, and then we got to the architecture because of the site. It's a magnificent site with the Malibu Mountains behind us and uh, 10 acres, which is a fair amount of property. And so we decided that the house itself had to be a response to the land. And because this is a hot and dry climate, we began with a kind of systematic approach to landscape where we designated where in this dry climate we might want to put water, where we need to look at fire protection versus irrigated zones, and where we would put planting versus the native chaparral. And also the scale was large enough that, as we said to the clients, plant whatever you want. We will help you in terms of the plant selection. But it's so big, it's so open, that if we think of the landscape strategy like crops, it's appropriate as opposed to kind of small decorative residential landscape thinking. So here is a model of the site with house. Yes, this is a house. Um, that is connected by pool, underground guest quarters around to a stables and a caretaker lodge. As uh, all architects in the audience know, often not everything is built, so what is built is the house, which is also fine. So because of the landscape and because we have friends who are the owners who have a lot of stuff, we said the strategy for the building should be three viewing machines, a kind of trinocular, so to speak, where you have very open rooms completely glazed at each end to these amazing distant locations, and all of their stuff was to be located in storage zones along the long walls so that we could keep the interior spaces open. So the design completely was a result of a, a kind of multiple of landscape and stuff. And here is the house in the garden. And here are the, some of the, it happens to be lavender planting in this scale of, of crops, of farms. And you see that these three wings that are facing the views are open to a kind of domestic scale on one side where you can get there and then open to the Malibu Mountains reaching out beyond the house on the other side. And... Uh, Within these very, very generous living spaces, one gets a sense of these different views. Again, the landscape coming into, into a very minimal house construction. And even in our thinking of the, the storage walls, even included things like the bathroom construction that reaches around to house all of the pieces of the bathroom so that the openness is never closed. And that's the Tepec House. Ah, the material is great fun because this is a project that is viewed as you approach the site from the top, of course, from the sides, and then as one comes around from below. So we wanted to wrap each of those in the same material. This is a fire zone, so there are very few materials we could use, um, and... One would have been a kind of uh, Ethernet solution of, of cement boards. But we decided to work with a red rubber roofing that um, is, was glued on all the way around. The clients are doctors, and they said, let's get this straight. You now want us to live in a rubber house. And we said, yeah, isn't that great? And uh, it took a little bit, but they decided they liked it, and uh, so they live in a rubber house.
won this very big competition for the airport of Zurich, and we had to face the problem of very, very large uh, numbers. So the building, uh, this is the city of Zurich with a lake, with a classic uh, agglomeration, uh, and the, the airport is here, and the building had to be situated in uh, this uh, location. So this is the building, but the most important thing of the building is that although it's 500 meter long, we decided to do only four corners and not to be extravagant in the formal appearance of the building. So we rejected any type of airports that we had seen all over uh, the globe. So said restrain, 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 wherever it is possible. The most important thing, however, was, was the team, uh, a team that we didn't have, and we decided uh, to do a heterogeneous uh, team with young architects, older architects, engineers, structural, mechanical engineers, uh, people with a lot of talent in one field that, you know, and, and people with a talent in another field, different characters. At the end, we were over 40 uh, people in this group, and they all had to work in the same space and all at the airport for five years. In order to sustain that, that, that madness, we hired a psychologist here. Uh, and, and, and she became, and she saved us a lot of money, uh, and she was coaching us. She was telling us how to talk to the client, how to communicate, uh, how to prepare the material. Uh, it, was un, it was an unbelievable uh, experience. So this is on the psychologist. Uh, but as I said, the most important thing of the building is below ground, and we found this uh, house, beach house, uh, in not far away from San Francisco. We took this image, and this was the idea of the psychologist that we should communicate with images, uh, and we shrank it, we multiplied it, uh, and we explained to the client, this is your building. Uh, it's a millipede. <laughs> Sorry? They panicked. They panicked. Uh, they said, why do you want to do a millipede? We said, well, the ground is bad. Uh, what, what, what we need is very long pile, pilers uh, that go yeah. down into the bedrock. Uh, and those pilers have to reach uh, granite. Uh, but we would like to do something intelligent with them. Most airports are built on bad land, usually, where the city didn't, didn't grow. So what we did is we did a structure that is 500 meter long. This is the bedrock. This is where the airplanes are. And so this is where, where the money of, of the project went, is, is what you do not see is below ground. So, however, the, the system of, of, of the piles uh, is going through the entire structure. And since economy is an important factor uh, these days, in architecture, and more and more so, uh, we decided to use the most banal type of uh, park garage uh, construction that uh, contractors can do cheaply or affordably. Uh, and then to use the pilers, this is a section, uh, for the uh, heating and cooling of the building. So the mechanical engineer and the structural engineer and the architect had suddenly to talk to uh, each other and find the same language to uh, communicate. So we have 250 geothermal energy foundation piles. This is called surface geothermal because we're not going very deep into the ground. Uh, they are about 50 meters to 70 meters deep, and they are 90 to 1 meter 50 uh, in, in diameter. Inside those piles, we put little the PVC pipes, about two, two and a half centimeters deep, they go in and out, uh, and water is being transported uh, through them without any special other liquid. We didn't know if it would work because of the vib vibration that you need for the concrete, so we put too many of those little pipes in just as a kind of standing uh, reserve. And on top of the roof, we put 5,000 uh, uh, square meters of uh, photovoltaic uh, cells. So what you see is ultimately what you get. Uh, the building is entirely stripped. It's, it's this park garage construction. Um, we wanted to do asphalt on, on the ground, but Swiss Air that existed at the time uh, panicked. So we give them terrazzo, which cost three times more, but they didn't care. 
uh, and uh, Manuel designed uh, the chairs that are also the exhaust uh, elements of it. The uh, passenger information system is nothing else than paint on, on concrete, to be very direct, so nothing uh, super fancy and, and high-tech. Um, and we got a, finally also a landscape designer to, to give us uh, uh, some plans. This is the buffer zone on the, on the no, uh, east and the west of the building as a kind of a sweater that is around the thing. And this is where the passengers uh, go down uh, to uh, the airplanes. And we illuminated them with blue light, blue neon light on blue color, which is very rare to do blue on blue. So when you, you go down to the airplanes at night, you really think it's a surreal experience. Uh, and this is the roof uh, on top. And then a, a very small detail is uh, airplanes have to be on flat ground. So they can't go over steps. But topography is never flat. So there is a 0.6% slope difference from one side to the other, which makes, with 500 meters, makes three meters difference. We drew all the plants flat. Uh, the contractor had to just deal with it because of force of gravity, uh, and, and they, they managed somehow. But the client was explaining this at a press conference, very proud that we could do a building that was tilted but not really tilted because you can't notice it. The press misunderstood, thought the building was sinking, and Manuel and I spent days with Swiss TV trying to explain them that this was not the case, that Swiss engineering is solid and it's not really sinking. We nevertheless called our engineers to make sure it didn't sink. When the press found out that it was not sinking, it was not interesting anymore. So this is some images uh, of, of the building. And uh, who is doing number 12? So a second uh, transportation infrastructure project is in Portland, Oregon, which is north of California. And the story I want to tell you about this is that this is a very complex technical installation that then somehow also became interesting at the level of Paris next week of fashion, a combination we never anticipated. Um, this, this was an interesting project in terms of urban needs, that there is a very large hospital complex at the top of a hill that had nowhere to expand, and hospitals need to expand in order to maintain their presence. The only place they could build new buildings was three-quarters of a mile away in the only undeveloped riverfront property in the city but they had to be able to get humans there quite quickly, not depending on surface transportation. So the city and the hospital decided to create an aerial tram, um, and they decided that in order to get the city to accept it, there would be an architectural competition, and so it would look good. Well, we won the competition, and um, we built this project that became a series of very strange creatures in the city. Uh, this is the upper station at the hospital, and this is a site that had almost no ground area. It was surrounded by buildings under construction. The hospital had planned so badly that people leaving the public transportation have to pass through a medical building to get to ground on the other side. And so we had no idea if it was even physically possible. And we included the structural engineer in that discussion. So the, pro the buildings are really quite minimal. It was a stripped down aesthetic, something that we've done in several projects but we had no room to breathe. So the braced frames are because we had no room to spread the legs out. They had to land on a very small piece of, of dirt between the eye clinic, the road under construction. And uh, there, the forces of this, of this um, aerial tram are significant. There's a lot of vibration, but that couldn't even transfer into the hospital behind it because they do things like open heart surgery. 
So if the house was on one foot, as Mark described, this one was on one foot with a million pounds of force pulling you downhill, but they just because of the machines, you couldn't set back because there's a hospital building. Um, you couldn't hold on to anything because there was nothing to hold on to. And so we never had so much fun designing a structure in our lives. And again, this upper station is a very odd set of creatures, but it's really great fun and dramatic, and somehow it did work, thank God. Um, then there is a, a single mast that is, is the only intermediate support between the upper and the lower stations. This, like the upper station, it was sculpted based on the physics of the forces that are acting upon it. It's right next to the interstate freeway, so we had the, the time period for building it after we were out of the ground were three separate nights where we had a permit from 9 p.m. till 5 a.m. the next morning. Um, there was no chance that those would be expanded, and this was erected in three separate pieces, and again, it was great fun. And it also becomes this kind of odd, odd piece in the city, this odd sculpture. The lower station is quite simple. It's on the ground. The machinery is below. And it acts as the center to this new urban development, including the link to the light rail tram of, of the city. Then, a month after we were finished, um, the fashionistas arrived, and we were absolutely delighted that with all of the technical issues we had been dealing with, that it was really a cool place for fashion photos. So these become our favorite uh, documentation of the project. Are they never altered? Of course not. <laughs> it just happens. Great. This is what it is when you're on, on the, the tram looking toward the entire West Coast. And number one. Number one. Number one is a other scale. Uh, it's an urban project. Uh, we are now working for the last 15 uh, years. It's the headquarters realm of uh, the sports company called Adidas. Um, and what it is about the fluid morphology, I try to explain in the following. That's uh, where what the site we encountered, a uh, Franconian small little town, uh, military base, used to be of the Germans, and then the Americans uh, had it and didn't uh, return from one of the Gulf Wars. And it was free land, and Adidas, uh, the, the brothers who had their sweatshop down here, uh, they, Adidas decided to buy the land and uh, opened an international competition, uh, which we uh, won. And our thinking on one hand, or basically our approach, was to look at the site, with what the landscape is about. And you see the detached uh, thing. So it's about the square kilometer uh, of uh, land outside of the uh, village. But also the program uh, with three parts, uh, the headquarter housing and the commercial realm, and we invented the third, uh, fourth element, the public realm, to separate them, which was even a long-term, uh, for a long, uh, quite a while, a good thing. So we have here this Y, the green Y, connecting to the landscape. We have housing here. Uh, the Adidas World of Sports, how they call it, and the commercial center here. And that was the model uh, 1999, as you uh, can see. We worked with them uh, on the master plan, and we encountered quite some difficulties because there was a spread between the, the imagery we uh, uh, built up. We didn't have time to uh, design uh, houses or buildings, so we took a friend's sculpture. So he's an artist, so he had nice sculpture. We thought they would fit. We put it in the landscape and said that's an idea about buildings, how they could uh, look. But we encountered a whole field of tensions within uh, the firm. 
So, well, the, they talk about quality, but it has to be cheap. It's like they talk about flexibility, but one needs also continuity. And they say Adidas is, blah, 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 blah. and then you find out that uh, you have hundreds of different variations and ideas. And on the other hand, um, development went on. There was a competition done here, wild uh, construction. The town came closer, and the free side got under uh, pressure. And over the years, I think the not everything is showing. Um, the thing which helped us is that we concentrated on the, the conceptual uh, idea, which, which was to declare it as a campus, to uh, say, uh, to, uh, talk about buildings in a grove, uh, because there were some nice uh, trees uh, there, to talk about variety, because we learned that they are into competition and every building was a result of a competition done by another architect, but also about where are the centers and sub-centers and how the usage is uh, spread. And this helped to continue with this with an idea we had in the, in the competition in the first master plan some 14 years ago, uh, and this, the base was about uh, 1,100 workplaces. And uh, every two to four years, we would work uh, on the master plan, and it grew. Next, four years later, they said, ah, oh, it's about 2,000 uh, workplaces. They were scared of these big sculptures. We presented them, is this a building or not? So we spread them, we made clusters of uh, smaller buildings, uh, density uh, came some uh, ideas about special uses, some we did not know where it would go, like a gym. Uh, and years later, increased uh, volumes because of an increased number. Um, and, oops, I'm a little, a little bit too fast, so the first competition was done here, uh, which, funny enough, was a very simple, uh, big uh, shaped uh, building, and it increased again. So we were up to 6,000 uh, employees on the site. There was a competition won by Carter Wittfeld. We could do the sports center, and in the last year we did one of the parkings, and here a building which uh, under the same uh, roof houses uh, kindergarten and the gym. Uh, an idea, funny enough, we had in the very beginning to this um, to mix uh, usage, and so this is uh, quite recent. But they calculated that they have to go up to uh, ten thousand uh, working places. So this means that the, they had to buy more land, and the theme had to be extended. And finally, enough a thing we would we told them. Uh, is they extend also to the south where they years ago already built the factory uh, outlet and where is the real access to the whole realm and now competitions were done here and here uh, and next week is the jury about uh, this uh, site. Uh, many architects we could do some uh, building which is funny and in their own master plan on the side of other architects do you think? The first was the wardrobes for the soccer field and we realized it's totally wrong in our master plan. So what we did, we hide it underneath the earth. So this is under the grates, under the earth. So it's a building you cannot uh, see. And that were first shots of the building where we have the, the gym, the kindergarten, uh, which has been finished recently. And uh, since uh, numbers are increasing in working places, uh, parking is also a theme. So that's a parking for 1,500 parking lots, which has to be done because, unfortunately, it's out in the fields. I'm jumping again over the Atlantic to our project for the Children's Museum of Los Angeles. And as... You probably know a children's museum is not a museum showing children. It's really a kind of uh, discovery place where kids, the idea is that they learn through, through playing. 
Um, the most important thing for us was what I learned from the director of the museum before we started. I said, what do you really want? I've heard all of the normal stuff, but what do you want? And she said, I would like that the building is one where children have more questions when they leave than when they arrived. I said, that's good. We'll take that as our design mission. So the, the project, whoop, I just lost this. Let's go back. I'm going to have to yell here. Um, excuse me. That's part of the performance, right? Yeah, that's part of the performance. Wow. Great. Okay, that was the dancing part. The um, the building is quite simple. It's a large hall with with the exhibition pieces in it. It's in a park in Los Angeles. That's an infrastructure park, and uh, so of course it needed to be environmentally designed. And also, of course, there was basically no money. You've heard that before. <laughs> this is the plight of architects today. We're we're used to it. We decided that we had to think differently. There was no way that we could be designing as business as usual with the usual tools and the usual materials and then expect to have a building that ended up somehow different for kids. So we kept testing. This, for example, was... <laughs> the final slide of a presentation that Mark and I made to the board of directors when they asked what the concept of the building was. And we said, ah, you have the levels of platforms for the exhibits. You have the building we're reaching toward the landscape. These are trees. <laughs> and we will have sound wall protecting from adjacent traffic. And they weren't quite sure what to think about it, but on we went. And uh, we did a series of collages. We did dozens of these that were in what we call the design development phase, so after concept, before technical drawings. And we actually used these with, with scissors and cutouts and glue where we were looking at the building systems. Here, the photovoltaics, the uh, geothermal heating and cooling system, uh, the sunshades, and so forth, because we didn't know we were, where we were going to get with these, but again, we thought we just need to keep testing, and we had a lot of fun with them. Um, and these went on. For example, this is about the system of how you hang the exhibits, the acoustics, the flooring, the planting on the roof, and so forth. Or uh, we had a room that was actually a technical room for a nighttime cooling of the water system of the, because it's a hot climate for the, the cooling purposes. But it's a room that the kids could go into and get wet when they wanted so that they could figure out how a building works through messing around. Um, we carried that into materials, so we said we have real plants, we have fake plants. We have paint that includes chalkboards, so kids can write whatever they want on the, on the walls. Um, whether we were teaching them to be graffiti artists or not, I'm not sure, but we had a good time doing that. We looked at insul um, acoustic materials of pillows, so if the kids want to slam themselves into the wall of the building, fine, no problem. Um, again, there was no money, so when we had the photovoltaics on the roof, we discovered that there were these very odd American or maybe Chinese products of, of just a thin film photovoltaic, so we said, okay, we'll try that as well. This is not Swiss construction. And the building is built. So here is the, the entry sequence of colored volumes of bookstores and theaters and so forth. Um, in, at the entry side, it's a normal building of a big scale, this being the administration bar. Um, but at the other end of the building, it's only one meter high as the building of dives into the landscape. So the building is the height of the kids who are our clients. Um, we 
we looked at even things like the, the ramp that we needed for accessibility, and we wanted it to be the highlight so that universal access was real, but it was also playful, and kids with skateboards can go hauling up and down. But the main stair is really tucked in the back. We even played with the fenestration. So this is in the administration wing where they have enough windows, but it's still not entirely serious. Um, there was, again, money problems. And finally, after years of waiting, the, the building will finally be open for its proper use this summer after a very long time. crisis and so the kids didn't get the museum since 2008. So well, number 16. Number 16 takes us to the Swiss Alps, to a remote region in the Swiss Alps in Appenzell that you, you, you might know. Uh, and the most important thing is that we had on a window of six weeks to erect uh, the structure. So this, this became <laughs> the thing that we were working on. So the schedule, okay, this is the schedule. Uh, you, you can say we had basically uh, one year, one and a half year's time to prepare for everything. Uh, and Bauphase, this is the building phase. This is, those were the six weeks in which everything could be built. So this is the preparation sequence, uh, the six weeks, and then cleaning up work. Uh, since we are in Appenzell, where the women's vote was given very late in the history of mankind... Uh, we decided uh, to have a women's team uh, do uh, the project. Obviously, prefabrication was, was an issue, so we tested with uh, various forms. Uh, CAD CAM became key, so one of the early CAD CAM projects, and we found one of the most sophisticated wood-cutting, electronic, computer-directed machine in Appenzell, uh, we rented a hall to test the erection uh, process, so everything had to be tested uh, beforehand. Even the electrical wires were put in the wing, and you see the first element on the truck uh, being transported to the site. Now, we knew that route, uh, and we knew the law that you, could ha you had to have minimum 50 centimeters height below the bridge, and that determines the height of the building. So in order to get a little bit more, we rebuilt the truck. We lowered uh, the truck bed on this side. Uh, and then the elements arrived on site, uh, erection. And this is a movie of, of the six weeks. So we start with the foundation work. This is where the air ventilation system goes in. Then water uh, membrane is applied to it. Uh, the first wood templates are put on the side so that the workers know where it will be put. Then the mechanical systems are placed in place. Then the secondary wood construction is brought. When you see yellow, it means it rains because you need to protect the wood. Then the elements are coming in, being added one to each other. Okay, we are about week five here uh, and one week more to go. And unfortunately, it was constantly raining, which is not unusual in our country uh, and then the final uh, cladding uh, of, of the piece that you see here. And it's a restaurant addition to a recovery center for people that went to a hospital uh, to spend some time in the Swiss Alp. Uh, there are two views. There's the view from the restaurant out in the landscape, and this is the view from the parking lot when you uh, arrive. Uh, some snow, uh, project number nine. But before project number nine... The only complication in our six-week schedule was that I think it was the European Soccer Championships, and unfortunately for us, Switzerland made it to the quarterfinals. So suddenly none of the workers showed up. And we were really glad in our office when they lost because then we could get back to business. <laughs> back to business. Uh, next project is um, on a theme which is quite common, and it's uh, the... Um, change of use of old factory uh, sites. The typical condition, and as you have it here in Paris too, Paris, the, the density of the built surrounding is a little bit higher, but here, kind of the old village, close to uh, Zurich, 
and this is the realm where all the factories uh, were, and this is the site we were invited for a, a competition. It grew, grew over the years, a hundred years of a growing uh, factory. The owners uh, sold the, the factory, the production to Siemens, and uh, wanted to gather the production in here and have the land free for development. Why? Because even if it does not lock, it's very close to the center of Zurich, because here you have the train station, and in less than nine minutes, you're uh, on Bahnhofstrasse in the very center uh, of uh, Zurich. Our thinking, um, oh, and this, there was a special uh, issue in the question, say, uh, is it possible to have housing here? So in a whole zone of uh, factories and some offices, is it possible? And we said, yes, it's possible if we block off the noise of the railway and the noise of the street, which is an important street for um, uh, cars uh, going around in agglomeration. And closing off those, it, we might think about having some uh, housing here uh, in the middle in a spacious thing where we, have, we can even keep some uh, existing uh, trees. Uh, what happened is the, the day when we won the competition, the owner said, yeah, but you know, within two years, this office building has to be built. So we hurried up and we built first an office uh, building and then did the, continue with the master planning. And uh, luckily enough, we could do a second uh, phase in this uh, realm here, here not. Uh, but uh, it changed. Where we have uh, meant to have office buildings, they said, no, we want more uh, living. So it, we started the lots of studies uh, to make uh, housing uh, possible there with a, quite a high density. So it's about uh, 2.0 uh, square meters of built surface in relation to the ground uh, surface and about 150 uh, units, and we were the pioneers there. So we thought about how can we create enough quality uh, in, within uh, this realm, and that's the project in the second phase, 50 units here, 100 here, so in on a length of about 200 meters, and of course, this long bar which should uh, uh, keep off the noise was meant to be housing, so it's a special typology, typology uh, in uh, reaction to the noise uh, issue on top of a ground floor with uh, housing. Uh, what, the, what we were interested in is also what kind of building typology is possible because we thought it's, it's interesting to keep some uh, atmosphere of the existing. This is the old Hammersmith. The owner decided, even if it's not used, to keep it and the guild is uh, hammering uh, there. And so what, how, how can you do a new building uh, adjacent to the other? And we realized that they started with the building, then they built just the next and the next. So the 50 in the 50 this, then in the 60 they built this two-story height, and in the 80s they built something on top. So we decided uh, to continue uh, this thing, and uh, we have the 50s, we have now the, the 80s, and this has been built some not even 10 years ago uh, where we gathered uh, all the working place for uh, Siemens in order to have the rest of the land uh, free. So it's uh, just adjacent, glued basically on with connections uh, to it, uh, the conglomerate of different uh, pieces with a base which was meant to be a factory hall, but in the end uh, it's now a sports uh, hall. And really funny corner where the old buildings get, get together with the new. Um, obviously, its uh, mirroring is uh, increasing the density of the collage. Second part is the long uh, building where we uh, worked hard of having different orientations, a step back, different units uh, of head. We even in introduced a mesonette uh, warning on a housing on a roof, which is uh, public. And um, Sarah also kids us because uh, the building in Switzerland is very expensive. 
uh, that's true to understand it, but nevertheless we have to try to build cheaply. And so this issue of having high-density housing in these factory uh, areas is uh, quite a challenge uh, for, um, for us. So uh, the question of uh, variation, double-story uh, height rooms, uh, changing with the balconies was an issue on the long uh, bar, which uh, the client in the end proudly said, ah, that's a living machine, not knowing uh, Corby, uh, not being an architect, not knowing Corby, I thought it was quite uh, fun and he loved it. So the second building, which are two of a group of possibly five in this in between realm here, you see the very old tree we could keep. The question was kind of how can you proceed doing buildings with your, in your own scheme which don't look alike. So it was um, the teams uh, were split and they, uh, one team got the long bar, bar another team did the design of this and the next of this in order to reinforce uh, the differentiation and that's what uh, we were working on. And of course you have stacked, so this is a one staircase with five to six flat on a on one uh, level, changing uh, the typology within uh, the building uh, and even on the north facade toward this Hammersmith's alley, uh, kind of giving a variation and a similar issue here. That's also a variation of the theme, uh, but here the construction is much cheaper than in the project I show you beforehand. The funny thing is, was that in this realm we could do part of it. We, there was this planning. We did an older scheme for, uh, for offices here. Lampugnani did win a scheme, uh, did the Milan uh, block round plan in here. And we were asked with another client to make proposals uh, in here. We tried different things. And we figured out that the best thing is to keep uh, similar attitudes with an open structure in the middle, closing off uh, the noise to continue the thing because with the others he didn't like and in the end he said, you know, it's, it's not for, uh, it's, it's for any reason that we uh, called you because I like this part better than this uh, part. So um, that's a second project with another client where the variation of it on the theme is spatially it's similar. Density is the same on a quite a small uh, plot. Uh, and a client who has other uh, aesthetic uh, ideas, and that's what we are working on now. And we try here to involve in a scheme which allows variety uh, not only in the volumes, but also in the uh, plan, and that's what we are working on, but trying to keep all parts, as you can see here, so this, this juxtaposition of uh, old houses, office building, living houses here, there's another kindergarten, is key to uh, bring in, in earlier times, quality to those very new urbanizations. Good, number 10. It was a competition uh, we won for the International Union for the Conservation uh, of Nature. It's one of the early international unions partially connected to, to the UN, uh, dedicated to saving uh, endang endangered uh, animals. So you might know the red list. So here, uh, because it's a, con a uni uh, 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 a union for the conservation of nature, they had the obsession to get a LEED platinum certificate. So this is the best uh, sustainability certificate uh, that you can get, uh, and nobody had achieved that in, in Switzerland at the time. Uh, so we had to train our people in LEED platinum. So this is totally bizarre. But in terms of money, uh, Anything, any franc, uh, sorry, we don't have the euro. Every euro you want to spend, they said, could we not spend it for saving elephants or for saving giraffes or something, something else? So it was constantly a moral issue. Can you do it for less money uh, or, uh, or 
more expensive, and then you will kill other elements, uh, other animals. So uh, there was an existing building here, and we had to do an addition. So I'll show you first the, f the final uh, thing, the existing building, uh, an addition to it. So we said it had to be as simple as possible. So again, uh, a rectangle. And we did the entry between the old and the new, and I will show you some images there. This box that we added on top was not in the program. So we said you need, you need something very important uh, because when you are up there, you have magnificent, magnificent views of the Lac Léman. Uh, let's try to spend the money for this. They didn't want to do it. Somehow, miraculously, through contacts with the industry, we were able to get this additional box funded, and this is the main conference room overviewing uh, the entire lake of, of Geneva, uh, Lausanne. So very simple column system, uh, very simple facade. Uh, the diagonal was by chance, when you connected the column, you got uh, a north-south orientation for, for photovoltaic. So this is the photovoltaic. This is the think tank on top. This is the existing uh, building. All fire exits uh, on the outside. Uh, here are the fire uh, exits. This is quite important because then you liberate the center from any fire loads and you can use it for other functions. Uh, we had 14 <laughs> heat pumps um, going down, 14 boreholes with this machine, and this time, compared to the airport, we went five times deeper. We went 250 meters deep, and now with the technology we could, where we could collect the heat uh, on, on the top, bring it down, store it uh, over the summer, and bring it back uh, to, to, heat, to heat the building in the winter. So kind of, uh, it's a very interesting system with, which allowed us uh, also uh, to basically let over, heat through the facade uh, out. Uh, the facade, this is the fire escape. Uh, we picked up the theme of the photovoltaic uh, on top uh, with uh, special concrete. We tested with concrete. We even tested to put glass in it, which didn't work, so we gave up on that idea. But at the end, we did a very simple thing. We used the one side of the formwork on the inside and then the other side of the formwork on the other side. So it's the same panels, but once put towards the inside, once put towards uh, the outside. The loads are carried across, Okay, from this column to that column to that column to that column to the basement. Very this is, sorry? Very simple. Very simple. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, the box uh, on top that you see uh, here, this is the conference room, the existing building, the entry sequence, uh, and the use of insulated uh, concrete, which we developed with the company from the inside to the outside and back uh, to the inside without additional uh, insulation. A view towards the Mont Blanc and the Lac Léman, uh, and then the view from the outside of this box over uh, the photovoltaic uh, panels. Good. Number five? Two more, more. I think it's Sarah. No. No? Max. So I take it. <laughs> okay, so the next is the infrastructure building uh, again. It's uh, covering a uh, part of the highway. And the question is, what is it uh, quite important? So it's um, basically a street which was in a little village on the outskirts of the town of uh, Zurich. And after the war, it extended, and so they want not go through it. And that's the situation you see in 37, 1937. Uh, and some smart guys who already realized that traffic is an issue. Uh, there is a garossier uh, having his uh, house uh, here. In the map of Zurich, you see that it's one of the main arteries going into the center uh, of Zurich. And on the left, you see the situation now. It's about 100,000 uh, cars a day passing by, so it's one of the most dense, uh, dense traffic alleys. And within the urban fabric, and we had uh, the competition uh, where we proposed 
other than our colleagues, just to leave the street where it is to cover it and use the top of it or the, the whole infrastructure as a new piece uh, of landscape in the net of uh, landscape elements within the urban plans of down in the, in the 40s. So this is the situation we uh, encountered. That's a tunnel going into Zurich, and that's where it spreads toward the airport, uh, east and uh, west. And so it's a length of about uh, a, a kilometer, and that's what we uh, proposed. Uh, um, funny enough, uh, in the beginning, nobody believed that it could be done because, again, it's expensive. I mean, it's hundreds of millions of Swiss francs. By now, it's about uh, 200 million uh, euros. But a smart engineer calculated that the effect of this building uh, is much better than all this funny covering of highways somewhere uh, else in the landscape. Uh, and so the, the uh, ministry was forced to uh, pay this, and the project... Uh, went uh, on. But so you see this section, it's about 30 meters wide, 7 meters high. Partially there is a tram tunnel underneath, so which doesn't make it easier uh, to. And then the load of what can be above, exhaust uh, chimneys and so on. And the question, and we wanted people to get up, and this question is, what is it? And in the beginning, uh, to make a difference to our competitors, well, the Inner and Inner lifted up in uh, the whole highway and uh, hot made a tunnel. Uh, we said, yeah, it's like, I mean, we keep it and it's like a dam. Imagine like a dam. We realize that it's not the center uh, of life uh, in the neighborhood. So we said it's some uh, common uh, ground. And since here it's binding to the hill, that oh, we can bind it, bind the surface uh, to the natural uh, terrain. So that was our thinking, which some pieces uh, shown. Uh, and but then the people of the town they loved it that much. This uh, image with the sheep. They said, "Oh, let's cover everything." Uh, so it was this dam, this, this dam, dam idea uh, was <laughs> too strong. So uh, we said, "No, it's not. It's not possible." We said it's I've, it's both, and and the other thing was also they wanted to cover it because they were scared of big walls in the middle of the city. But here, that's downtown uh, uh, Zurich, it, they exist and they are part of the urban fabric and work quite well. So we were said it's both, it's uh, it's them and uh, wall. Engineers came later. And when they start to realize what's all uh, canalization and uh, ducts and so on, they say, no way to do a dam on the site. So in the, it turned out to be uh, a, basically a wall, a, a built wall in the flatland uh, we have here around. So we went on and said, we, have, we need the landscape architect. And the landscape architect we've chosen uh, proposed, whoops, proposed then to say, okay, this is an artificial landscape. It's a not typical landscape, and that's what it is. So what in the model, you see here the surface, 30 meters wide, a kilometer long, following the tracks of uh, the street, very dense to existing buildings. Some already moved out. Others were really scared. Uh, though that was the spatial uh, situation. And the landscape architect said, okay, that's, let's cover this uh, concrete tunnel, because it has to be of concrete of uh, money reasons, and have a park with fields on it, fields which is like a, kind of a, a, a visa, a lawn, but also with some patterns where you can play, uh, traffic, uh, bicycle traffic uh, is an issue. And... Um, so it's like a, a new park uh, on another uh, level. So that's where you see the, the lighting ideas. Here these exhaust pieces, which were smaller in the beginning, and they grow. 
What was important for the people is kind of what is uh, this thing, this wall and landscape help to say, ah, it's a, a grown wall. We, you can have different plants. Uh, we have a whole list of plants which will uh, grow, but it's also a building. So it's uh, both uh, landscape, but it's also an infrastructural uh, building. And that's where our part is, is when what a year do we have or can we have? And the idea was not to show a blank concrete, but to see it rather as a rock, as a, an old stone wall. Uh, so we proposed to a special treatment that we talk about and say, okay, the other things, technical things adjacent, all out of steel. Some moved, so we had to be quite uh, systematic in this uh, thinking. And then the, that's, that's a, this is a mock-up. Uh, of the wall, and we have it in our office to figure out how the, the texture of the wall comes together with the railing and with the uh, cables for uh, the growing uh, plants. And we are, had now samples done with different techniques. So uh, we have an extra uh, two, three centimeters of concrete, and they will part of it will blast it off by uh, hydro uh, pressure in order to show the conglomerate. The question, what is it? We still don't know because it's a bridge, it's a tunnel, um, it's a park, it's a wall, it's a building. Um, and But the, the interesting part, since we talk to all the neighbors, hundreds of them, uh, they now start to like it and they make up their own ideas of how it could be and what it is uh, for them. And it's not only this in the section, but it will be also um, an entry uh, entry door for uh, Zurich with this uh, great opening. If you arrive with the taxi into Zurich, that's the entry uh, to Zurich. And uh, it's part of uh, Swiss culture to have things done underground. We're complete. We're concluding with a number that isn't, but it's the combination of them in terms of our being in Paris, which is the show that we are having around the corner at La Galerie d'Architecture. And we would like to again thank the team, Jean Maurizio, Muriel, Fanchon, and Natalie. Thank you so much. You guys have been really a pleasure to work with. We wanted to tell you a little bit about what we are doing because it's still a story of what happens and what goes wrong. Uh, this is a plan of the gallery, and we had the idea to install a wall on which we would mount some of these kinds of stories about our projects, so fragments of projects. I thought it would be great to use a recycled material that was light, so cardboard, to hang it from two columns in the space and to let it be a flying wall. So we worked with this five-week-long installation of cardboard with a very fancy Swiss structural engineer, uh, Joseph Schwartz, who helped me develop the concept of basically a draped cable, almost a catenary curve with two points of suspension with brackets holding it up to these two columns and so forth. Um, we love the idea. So in Los Angeles, we built a half-scale mock-up of the thing, and we couldn't believe that it actually worked. So we were thrilled. Uh, we also tested putting loads on it because corrugated cardboard is not meant to be hanging things from its skin. Um, but somehow it, it, it actually was happening. So we were very excited. We came and the gallery said, great, do it. So we arrived in Paris with a very large pile of cardboard and we laid it on the ground. We started to install the cable. Um, we unnecessarily spent a half a day of the three-day installation trying to drill about a half a centimeter hole to reinforce the cable took us all day, and we still couldn't drill the French steel, but it was a little dramatic. Um, we lifted the wall, and then 
it, we made it vertical because we were able to find some workers down the road to help us lift the whole thing. But unfortunately, it sounded a bit like an earthquake. Something was not happy. And we realized that the glue had never dried. So the only thing that we didn't bring from either L.A. or Zurich was the white glue, because I thought anywhere you can get white glue. And somewhere in France, there must be a white glue that works, but we didn't find it. So these puddles were existing two days after we lifted the wall, and we said, now what? Well, obviously we couldn't hang it because it had no structural stability. So we said, okay, now it's a standing wall. And uh, that's what happens in architecture. You need to go to plan B. You just don't know which plan B will be needed when. So we said, it's now a standing wall, isn't that great? And luckily, Jean was saying, I like it very much in the space. Thank you for saying that. Uh, we installed our pieces, and then it worked. We had an opening. It's still standing. Um, again, with the opening, with the intention being that the visitors are peering at these pieces of, of our work. And... I am so happy that it's still standing. I can hardly stand it. Um, and we had a great time, and we thank you and um, appreciate your coming here tonight. Thanks. Thank you. But I know, Olivier, is it usually tradition to take questions or not? Yeah? Good. Any comments, questions, uh, criticism? Yes. Did you do any schools? Yes. We did schools. We did, uh, we did an American school in Zurich which is in the exhibition, but we didn't show uh, tonight. That's one of, uh, it's a, a quite interesting building, and you can go and see it. We did very small uh, shel roof shelters for the school district in Los Angeles on 50 different sites. But the real school was IUCN. Uh, but we, we I, I tried. Mean, I mean, we, Zurich we International School. But we tried for about 10 years because 94 we did the competition and we realized it doesn't make sense to have to design a school which is based on our own experience then 20 years ago, not by now more. So we collaborated with a, a teacher. So a teacher teaching teachers. And he basically thought, told us also what is the new thinking in didactics, and we tried to make a, a project which uh, the school people liked it and the architects not. So we won second prize. <laughs> uh, but we were on a track and basically it took us several competitions until this Zurich International School where we could make, the, I mean, continue with the same ideas, uh, have our knowledge about cheaper uh, building and make it Swiss enough that the jury liked it. And so we could uh, do this uh, first school that uh, has been finished now some six years ago. It's, oh, a, yes. it's, it's more than a school. It's a, it's a campus in one building. So that's, that's the concept. But I would need to show the plans to explain that. Other questions? Thanks. Uh, I want to know because I study French, uh, study architecture in France, and I visited uh, Swiss and visited Zurich uh, this summer. I was curious to what is uh, your philosophy, your company's philosophy, compare in, in, in your thinking when you create your jobs and comparing to the French philosophy of the architecture? And maybe, <laughs> how do you think about it? <laughs> French Thank philosophy, you. that's quite the thing. Eh? Well, I like, I like French philosophy, I have to tell you. <laughs> that's his part. <laughs> no, 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 architecture is not a story. There are a few, few that we like. <laughs> no, I like, I like French philosophy in general. 
Okay. But uh, French architecture, we came with the entire office uh, to France, to Paris, uh, and we we spend a lot of time uh, at the edges of of Paris to see the new new developments, uh, but also to see the grand ensemble of the post post war year, which uh, you know we were very impressed by the Pouillon uh, ensembles that that were created. So I th I think there there is there is a, there is a past in in French architecture that is extremely. Uh, exciting and that has great, great also potential, especially if you would combine it with French philosophy. <laughs> now, our philosophy is heterogeneous, as you probably have seen from from the work, because Sarah is coming from a totally uh, different different world. Uh, I'm somewhere in between. Manuel is 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 coming from from Switzerland. Uh, I would say. One of the key things is that we don't have a specific style that, that interests us, but uh, we, we try to find what is the essence of, of the assignments uh, and spend a lot of time designing processes. So how, how to get there? Why do we need to work with a teacher? Uh, why do we need to have a psychologist uh, in the team? Uh, how can you address the, the question of costs? Uh, how do you address... The fact that everything changes. I mean, you you you, you try to to play soccer uh, in one in one architectural project, and then suddenly it has three goalkeepers and uh, a, a team with fifteen people rather than eleven. I mean, this is the the reality that that we experience, and and what we what we learned in 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 the past is that the solutions have be, have become more straightforward. Okay, so, for example, the school is only slabs stacked on top of each other. It's, uh, it's again, a park garage uh, construction in which we inserted classrooms, uh, libraries, uh, gyms, uh, etc. So our thinking has changed over, over, over the years. So this is, I think, uh, quite, quite exciting. The, the biggest thing we experience is the financial crisis um, in the U.S. So maybe Sarah wants to say something about that. I mean, we experienced several crises, but that one was the biggest one. I don't need, I don't need that one. I have my own. Um, yeah, the, the difference between Switzerland and most of the rest of the world in the last few years has been phenomenal. I mean, I think Singapore, Switzerland, and Sweden possibly are the, the countries that have remained on a positive building trajectory, and the rest of us have all crumbled and wiggled and sometimes gone up and then crashed back down and, and found that life is much more fragile. That changes men, everything, as we know, and it very much changes architecture because architecture is slow, heavy, and takes a while, and it's expensive. So... Um, I think that France and the U.S. is much closer in that sense of uncertainty, which uh, even though my Swiss colleagues think that life is changing there, it still looks really, really solid to me. So I think our philosophies are, are so, um, how can I say, they, they vary over time and over place, and probably the main thing we think about is staying flexible. Shall I make the Swiss yeah, then? Yes, the Swiss side. Yes, the, Swiss side. <laughs> no, the, the fact is that we, we are not typically Swiss, even within architecture. And it's not, it's not a goal even to be Swiss. So that's one thing. And the other thing is that it, I think it's really difficult to understand any culture. It's also difficult to understand an architectonical culture because it's not the uh, culture and so we, we are still uh, investigating. And uh, so I, th I think it's, it's, a, it's a little bit of danger to pigeonhole it, to have too much, too many prejudices. As, as has been said, I mean, the, the economy is going well. And there is still a craftsmanship. We have a, an educational system where you can learn architecture from, from the, 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 how we have now an apprentice in our office, so he's 15 years old, and he starts to, as a, a draftsman, and he can, be, he can become an architect. And I think these are parts which influences a culture. 
But who knows? I mean, if Switzerland is isolating itself more and more, in the end we might crumble too. So it's it's a it's a mixture of many things, and uh, I would not dare to say what is Swiss culture, and, and, and even less what is the difference in the French culture. Uh, thank you. Um, what is how does it uh, how it works the solar panels you put the one which are not Swiss? They looks like a soft um, material instead of the the rectangular um, strong plaques that uh, are usually used. That's yours. It, was it the on the Children's glued, Museum? The it looks like panel. a soft shield. Sarah. Yes. Sarah, that's yours. The rubber. No, the rubber it's not the, uh, the the solar. The, yeah. Children's Museum. That's Sarah's part. Yes. Yes. On the roof. Uh, uh, the Topanga. No, the house. It's, it's, yes. It is a product that that exists on the market, and it's photovoltaic, so you produce energy uh, with it. But we have moved away from, from this now, because we, uh, we, would, we work with hybrid co collectors, that is a combination of warm water collectors and photovoltaic cells. The warm water collectors on top, the photovoltaic cells are below, and with this you produce a lot of heat in the summer that you can, can store uh, in the ground. And we are going now down to 450 uh, meters. So we started airport 50 meters, then uh, the school was 150, IUCN was 250, now we're at 450 meters. Okay, so, so <laughs> we'll come out in China one day. <laughs> David? No, I, uh, I remember what you said about this system, and I think it's, uh, it would be interesting perhaps to explain it uh, more clearly about this idea of storing energy in the ground uh, during the summer to use it during the the winter because it's it's uh, and and the consequence on the you know the, the how you approach the 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 envelope and that it doesn't have to be as insulated as it, you know as it um, is as it is required today it's extremely interesting that you you're linking the two because we've we've thought about that um and the consequence that I think is the most interesting is all of the energy codes around the world are out of date. Okay, all of them. Because, because we can heat and cool from the sun and the earth, and we can store the summer sun and the heat in, in the ground to use again in the winter, it means that once you've built the building, energy is free. And since energy is free, then we don't have to think save energy anymore. And if you don't have to save energy anymore, then there's no reason for the enclosures to have to get thicker and thicker and heavier and heavier and more and more expensive because we can build as we used to and let the heat out. It doesn't matter. And what's so great about that is that makes anybody who is involved with energy calculations and the, and the government organization of that crazy. Because yeah. it's just out of date. It makes no sense anymore. It is a paradigm shift from saving energy suddenly to wasting energy. And wasting energy is associated normally with something very negative. You are not allowed to, <laughs> and suddenly you you can because you should also because you have to get rid of that that heat. Uh, and this is this is fantastic. You can so, show structure again. Okay. You, you can, can show the structure rather than than killing it. And the the materials of the of the building don't have to cost so much. There is a um, project in the exhibition, which is a multifamily house. And the uh, owner is a professor for technical installation at ETH. And he's the crazy guy. I mean, this is not our knowledge. We do the architecture uh, with him. And uh, so he, he went to this and said, there is enough energy. The problem is it's not there. 
when you need it, <laughs> and sometimes not in the quality you need it. So he is the guy drilling, so he helped us in the, with the airport. Uh, and in this house, we really go deep, and, and that's uh, leveled uh, out. He's such a crazy guy that he said that's the great system for renovation for all buildings, because you take out the heat in winter, you put it in the facade, and you store it in the summer. Uh, so when there was a phase in this process where basically we were planning a new house, which is supposed to be like an old house in, in order for it to make it possible for him to test the system. So uh, in the end, we had to make it uh, simpler because of uh, uh, costs. He didn't have enough money to pay his, his own experiments. But uh, this is this uh, kind of thinking where it's, it's, it's the, the energy is around but you need it in the right place, in the right moment, in the right uh, quality. But it's, it's against this, this insulation madness where you kind of you, you put more and more clothes on the buildings. And this makes buildings quite interesting again because you, we are interested in showing the, the, the structure, the, the, the way it's, it's, it's built, and this is possible again, but as has been said, we, we, you have to fight the rules and this label stuff and the, because it's about some label thinking. One more question? You have the last word. The last question. Yes, it was to, to come back to a question of uh, theoretical background linking maybe a little bit with the question of philosophy, but uh, speaking of the opposition and the complementarity between Swiss and French architecture and Swiss and French uh, theoretical attitudes, don't you think that this comes back to the end of the 19th century in this great opposition between Violet Duc and Zemper? And you have this Zemperian culture, which is your baby milk. And here in France, we have waited 150 years to have the translation of the first text of Zemper. That's because of Violet Duc, maybe. And that's this difference. We don't know what is the textile uh, complexion and the textile process. We are discovering it. We discovered uh, Adolf Loos at the beginning of the century, but Zemper, don't you think it, it has something to do with that? The Swiss box is much more a textile box than a Mission box. Miss is much more on Violet Duc and on French side. No? Yes, I agree. I agree. But Switzerland is, is a hybrid culture. <laughs> uh, and, and so, therefore, you have also Violet Le Duc uh, in, in Switzerland. So, so, so structure... Stru structure is, is extremely, is God <laughs> in Switzerland, but now combine structure and enclosure. So, you know, kind of uh, Semperian uh, Violet Le Duc-ness <laughs> is maybe at, at the core of, of, of what we do. But now, what is interesting is that with the energy codes, Violet Le Duc lost, okay? uh, and Semper won. And now with the new energy systems, I think we see hope again in Violet Le Duc. Now, what is interesting is that Sarah calls Viola Le Duc Valor de Duc, which uh, <laughs> turns the whole thing into irony. <laughs> Thank you very much. It has been a great pleasure to be coming. here.